Okay, let's make a start. I am Robert Wade. I'm a professor in the Department of International Development, and I have the pleasure of chairing this talk by Laura Cavallo, who is a, an associate professor of economics at the University of San Paolo with a PhD from the New School in Economics. So New School Economics means very different from mainstream, including LSE economics. Um, she, her research focuses on macroeconomics and on development economics, and especially the relationship between economic growth and income distribution, which in the past few years, but the past few years only, has become quite a hot topic, even within some parts of mainstream or almost mainstream economics. Um, and she is uh, also a columnist for the Sao Paulo um, newspaper Folha de Sao Paulo, and the author of a book whose, whose English translation, I think, is um, Brazil Wolves. The Brazilian Wolves. The Brazilian yeah. Wolves from, uh, from, um, from boom to economic um, chaos. Um, she just a few days ago posted a really interesting um, article <laughs> on a blog. Which blog was it? The one, the, the article the LSE, is called. Uh, oh, that's the LSE blog. Okay, so it's called one. How Did the Brazil Economy Help to Elect Bolsonaro? That's a striking title. How Did the Brazil Economy Help to Elect Bolsonaro? And it's posted on the Brazil Witch blog. The Sorry, Latin the LSE American which American blog? Center. Latin America Center. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Laura has um, said that as an economist, she's going to focus mainly on economic phenomena in her talk, but she agrees that in the discussion, we can also go somewhat away from the uh, more narrowly economic onto the politics of what's happening in Brazil. And just let me remind you, we, we have this extraordinary situation, well, extraordinary in many ways, but where, where the super minister, Moro, Sergio Moro, the super minister of justice, so he's not just a minister, he's a super minister, and very, very close to Bolsonaro. He, um, there, is a trans, there are transcripts and emails um, of him as the judge in the Lula case. So he was judging Lula, sending, getting ready to send him to jail. And in the course of that trial, these transcripts show that he, Moro, was advising the prosecutor what the prosecutor should say in order for him, the judge, to have grounds for sending Lula to jail and getting him out of the presidential race. I mean, this is a really extraordinary, extreme example of rule by law rather than rule of law. In any case, that's just um, something that we might move on to from the more hardline economics that Laura is going to talk about. Thank you, Robert. Uh, can you pass me the... Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll do it from here. Um, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, for Thank you, Mara, for setting this up. Um, I'm glad to be here to tell this sad story. I'm hoping not to to get all of you depressed, um, uh, so I'll, I'll try to 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 bring some some elements that um, relate to future prospects as well at the very end. Uh, I did change the title a little bit of the presentation um, because I'm I am telling an economic story, but I will try to motivate it um, at the beginning and at the very end of the of the presentation with uh, let's say other cases that, um, well, other phenomena um, that may be similar in some aspects um, around the world, including support for Brexit, Trump, and other, um, um, well, far right uh, uh, stories uh, around the world, Orban, uh, and so on. And, and I'll try to make this link between what's going on with the Brazilian economy and with income distribution in Brazil and other stories that have been told about the relationship between globalization, inequality, and the rise of the far right uh, around the world. Uh, so I'll start with this um, recent poll made with 
economic, um, basically economists in Europe. Uh, it was done by the, the IGN, the Initiative on Global Markets of the University of Chicago, where basically they asked a panel of experts, of economics experts in Europe, whether they think that rising inequality is training the health of liberal democracy. And surprisingly, uh, there's very strong agreement with that statement among economists in Europe today, right? Uh, um, in the second question, they asked whether enacting more redistributive expenditures and policies would be likely to limit the rise of populism in Europe. And I mean, even if there's less agreement with that statement, still um, a vast majority of respondents uh, these are economists in universities around Europe that are the prominent economists, um, either agree or are uncertain about that statement, but most of them, um, I would say, agree. So uh, this is something that I think has has been shifting and changing uh, in, in the past recent years, and uh, more and more, I think there is an understanding. Of course, there are cultural factors and, and many other aspects and dimensions uh, that are behind, um, including social network behavior and, and other things that may be common factors behind uh, these phenomena. Uh, but um, the economic aspects of it seem to, to be gaining, uh, uh, even within the economics um, profession, who is not necessarily always focusing, as, as Robert was saying, uh, on these aspects, have been acknowledging um, both the role of globalization and inequality for this. Um, when it comes to the economic literature, um, I, I mean, you can see this in different strands of the literature, uh, different explanations for why this uh, is happening um, when it comes to the economic roots of these phenomena. So, for instance, Branko Milanovic's uh, book on global inequality focuses a lot on the decline of the, the middle class around the world uh, as a source of, um, as, as leading to either populism or, or plutocracy in different countries. Uh, there's a lot of literature, recent uh, mainstream economic literature that tests econometrically uh, whether a shock or the exposure to Chinese imports in different districts, uh, in different parts of the world, uh, have led uh, to these phenomena. I mean, there, there's different papers doing that um, in, for, for different European countries and for the US and for, for Trump's uh, election. Uh, and there seems to be strong evidence uh, that it does, that in fact, exposure to Chinese imports is uh, relevant. Um, there's this paper by Danny Roderick, which was published at first in 2016, so it was before Bolsonaro's election, uh, which is interesting because it basically uh, talks about how globalization, different globalization shocks have affected different countries in different ways. And so, in a way, uh, he, he argues that in Europe and in the US, uh, the trade globalization uh, and immigration in particular uh, have played a larger role, which led these countries to, let's say, a right-wing, what he calls a right-wing cultural economic populist response, which basically focuses on um, a, a particular kind of societal cleavage. So both, uh, every populism, uh, in a way, uh, focuses on a societal cleavage, but this one would, would have an identity cleavage as the main focus as a response to this type of globalization shock. So because you have immigrants and a loss of manufacturing jobs coming from uh, trade globalization, then politicians in the right wing uh, spectrum would uh, take advantage of that to basically blame on um, those immigrants and so stressing identity cleavages as the solution to, to, to the problem, right? And then he argues that actually that's different from what's going on in Latin America and what's going on in Southern European countries, um, which due to the different type of globalization shock, which would be more like the financial globalization aspect and multinationals and the presence of, say, foreign investors as constraining uh, economic policy in these countries would tend to lead to uh, what he calls a left-wing populist response rather than a right-wing populist response. And the left-wing populist response, of course, he's thinking about uh, uh, not only Chavez in Venezuela, but all the, the pink-tied uh, candidates around the world. 
uh, around Latin America and also Podemos <laughs> in Spain and, and left-wing parties uh, in Southern Europe um, as focusing on a different type of societal cleavage, namely um, income cleavage. So, you know, the left-wing politicians would take advantage of another dimension of globalization to basically argue, well, the, the ones to blame are the rich or the elites, and, and this would tend to, to, to lead to uh, uh, a different type of populism there. And if we take that, I mean, clearly Bolsonaro is a counterexample. And, and how come, the question here is how come um, a right-wing um, candidate who focuses on identity cleavages had the room to uh, grow and be elected in a country like Brazil. And, and if, we, if, we, if we take another type, uh, another dimension in this literature, uh, which I'll focus more on, um, um, if, we, if we go away from globalization only, I mean, there's also a literature that talks about the effects of austerity and inequality um, for these phenomena. And basically, there is also evidence on that. So there is a paper which, if you haven't seen, it's a very interesting paper by Tiamo Fetzer. It's going to come out in the American Economic Review. Um, it's forthcoming, uh, which shows that social programs, cuts in social programs since 2010 in the UK uh, had a large effect on the support for leave in the Brexit vote. So uh, there seems to be a more short run. I mean, of course, globalization literature is talking about more long run trends in uh, the decline of the middle class and inequality, but apparently short run trends also matter. Short run uh, effects of um, welfare cuts uh, and welfare reforms seem to matter. Uh, there's also a paper for Austria that shows that, I mean, they use a, a social housing program uh, in Austria uh, that actually uh, was changed by regulation and allowed immigrants to get in the social housing program. And clearly this seems to have an effect. The, 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 the districts in Austria that are more subject to uh, dividing this social program, this housing program between uh, immigrants and residents actually saw a larger increase in support for far-right far parties. So distributive, distributive conflict over the provision of public goods seems to matter as well, or at least there is a hypothesis that it matters. Why am I saying all this? Because basically the motivation here is uh, to try to understand how Bolsonaro's election fits into current conventional wisdom on these particular dimensions, mainly the role of globalization and the role of inequality and austerity uh, for the rise of the far right. And in order to answer that, of course, we have to uh, go back a little bit to what happened in Brazil uh, since uh, in the last decades. Because the first thing that is striking is that as opposed to um, European countries and the US, Brazil actually seems to have benefited from trade globalization in the 2000s. I mean, uh, Chinese growth actually led to a commodity price boom. Um, um, Brazil benefited highly from that. Uh, we, we actually were able to take advantage of that boom to implement uh, redistributive policies and expand public investment quite a lot in the 2000s, uh, which in fact uh, was um, compatible with a reduction in public debt to GDP. So somehow we had a period in the 2000s where distributive conflict was not stronger, but actually weaker, uh, and we were able to, to, to implement a bunch of policies, and these policies led to Strongly employment growth, I mean, these policies as combined to the uh, external scenario, of course, uh, led to strong employment growth, strong real wage growth, and an increase in the wage share, especially at the bottom of the distribution. I mean, there were particular policies that had a very important role there, so rising minimum wages, uh, and then, of course, the, 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 the how the structure of the economy responded, uh, we had a booming services and construction sectors. These sectors hire are very intensive in hiring low-skilled workers, and so low-skilled workers actually benefited a lot from the process. Uh, um, just to, for you to have an idea, I mean, these are the phases of the commodity price boom. So um, the commodity price boom is phase two here. It lasts from 
2003 to 2011. In 2011, uh, we entered a stagnation phase, and then we had um, the, 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 the shock, like the negative shock since 2014. And we can say that the Brazilian economy follows a very similar path uh, to this. Uh, we also had a big growth in the 2000s, and especially in the second half uh, from 2005 to 2010. Uh, and if you take another chart, which Just is before federal, we go on, the Lula government, the Lula uh, government is 2003 to 2010, and then Dilma takes over in 2011. She's impeached in 2016, like just a year after uh, the, the the big fall in uh, commodity prices, especially in oil prices. Um, so yes, it does coincide with uh, important things in the political cycle. And if you take um, just one item uh, of the public budget, like federal investment, uh, you're going to see that, well, uh, during the boom, it was much easier uh, to promote and to expand um, public investment. Uh, in this case, this is just investment, actual investment in infrastructure and so on. But that's true for social spending as well. Uh, you had there an opportunity to to, to also implement domestic policy. So I'm not saying that the external scenario is the only explanation for what the boom that we had and for the higher growth rates that we had. But of course, conflict was lower, was weaker, and it was a, we were able to implement these policies without facing um, uh, budget constraints and in fact, while reducing public debt. Um, then the, since 2011, you see um, well, a fall and then a rise, but in general, a stagnation in public investment. And of course, we, since the crisis started, we've been um, cutting uh, these items quite fast. Um, as a consequence, um, if you look at income distribution in this period, uh, you'll see that basically the bottom 50% of the distribution, which is the black bar there, uh, has benefited the most from growth in the 2000s, very clearly. Um, the top, which is the red bar, has also benefited quite a lot in this first period. It did, it did benefit less after the stagnation. So after the commodity price boom ended, and also there was a shift in economic policy, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, there, uh, they started benefiting a little less. And as I'll show in the, in the last figures, this is when, I mean, already the Workers' Party starts losing support from the top 1%. I mean, they never had support for, from uh, the top 1% uh, as a majority. But, I mean, the big loss of uh, the economic elite uh, happens actually between Lula and Dilma's first election. So in 2010, between 2010 and 2014, as you'll see, uh, from 2014 to 2018, um, it, didn't, it didn't change much. I mean, the support had already been lost then. What changes more is what happened with the middle. And here I want to stress what's going on with both the middle 40% and the next nine, meaning the 90 to 99% percent percentile. Uh, these people benefited less from the boom, uh, relatively less. I mean, they still had real wage gains. Uh, but obviously, as I'll show later, uh, all of them lose after 2014, and the ones at the bottom, as usual, uh, lose uh, much faster uh, than the ones at the top, right? So uh, by the time we get to 2010, and I, I, I'll, I'll stress this here because I think there is a shift, there is an important shift in policy. By the time the commodity price boom ends, 2010 is the year Brazil grew the most in this period. We grew 7.5%. Um, and by the time we got there, we were already facing some challenges and some limits to that process, even before the commodity boom ended. Um, we had, and this is something I talk a lot about in my book. It's not going to be the focus here because I don't have time to go deep into this. We can talk about it in the Q&A. But uh, we were seeing already uh, services inflation picking up. Why? Because basically... Wage growth at the bottom, which I've just shown uh, that happened, actually ha leads to cost push inflation uh, in services in particular. Uh, this is a sector that doesn't face foreign competition. So basically, higher wages are passed through to higher prices very easily. 
Uh, and you were using uh, the, the, the big inflow of capital that was coming in the commodity price boom to actually hold the inflation down through uh, no valuation of uh, the exchange rate. So the Brazilian real was very strong uh, during this period, which allowed you to contain inflation for imports and tradable goods in general. So that for a while, this was the one, this was what did the role of, uh, did the job of containing uh, an inflation acceleration, uh, a general inflation acceleration. Um, another issue that was starting to show, uh, which led to a change in economic policy, was that uh, productive structure in Brazil was not moving together with demand. So you had more and more people entering the consumption market through this redistributive process, but you did not have from the supply side um, a diversification of our manufacturing structure. And that's where we converge a bit to what's going on elsewhere. I mean, we were not developing manufacturing, so we were not one of the, the main um, uh, gainers from globalization. We were also losing manufacturing jobs as did, uh, say, other middle-income and high-income countries, right? So uh, the Chinese were also, especially after the global financial crisis, import penetration um, increased a lot in manufacturing in Brazil, and we had been losing density in the manufacturing sector since the 90s, since trade liberalization. So it's not something that started there, but there was no change in this trend. We actually continued losing jobs in manufacturing, and China, after the global financial crisis actually entered the Brazilian market even more. So you see, if you, if you look at the figures, you're going to see that the disconnect between Brazilian imports and, and exports uh, is, becomes larger once Europe and the U.S. enter a crisis, because then somehow there's a shift in the direction of um, Chinese um, exports to Latin America and to the markets that were growing at that point. Uh, and finally, as I showed, I mean, there is another limit and challenge that was showing, uh, which is the top of the income distribution was benefiting quite a lot. Uh, it, it maintained its share in national income throughout the period, and that's not a low share, that's a very large, high share. We're talking about one of the most unequal uh, economies uh, in the world. And so basically, we did have another phenomenon that is similar to, to what's going on elsewhere, uh, called, say, a squeezed middle, or the middle class, as I showed, was um, decreasing its share. As the bottom gained and the top maintained, uh, the ones in the middle uh, were losing, right? So the decision when Dilma takes office is to change this agenda a bit. Of course, it coincides with, with the end of the commodity price boom, so conditions were not the same, and that's important because um, obviously um, it's hard to know counterfactuals and what would have happened if she had the same external conditions that Lula had. Uh, but the truth is she then decided to move towards boosting competitiveness uh, uh, through cutting costs, uh, different types of costs uh, of production. Uh, and so she had this agenda, which I call in the book the FIASP agenda. The FIASP is basically an association um, of manufacturers of the state of Sao Paulo, which played the, uh, a big role later on in the impeachment process. They, they, they were uh, officially supporting impeachment. But at that point, they were basically setting the economic agenda um, in the country. They, they did this list of demands and proposals, which involved a bunch of tax cuts and exemptions, uh, controlling energy tariffs, and a devaluation of the exchange rate to make Brazilian goods more competitive um, uh, in international markets. And basically, uh, the economic policy actually shifted in the exact direction. She, she basically did everything that these uh, sectors were um, asking for. And even these sectors had the support of the labor unions, so it was kind of a pact uh, for Brazilian manufacturing, in a way. So the, the whole objective, the idea, would be, was to, uh, in a way, change the type of growth that was happening and try to compete in international markets, boost exports, and make it more sustainable. But this wasn't really uh, what happened uh, afterwards. So, but, uh, 
um, yeah. make it more sustainable, you mean to boost manufacturing? To boost manufacturing not, and productivity not com- not and so commodities, on. Not commodities, though. Not commodities. So the, the idea was that you would then finally diversify the industrial structure and um, do something like that. But when, yeah. when you actually look at the actual policies and measures that were taken, uh, in fact, like these were uh, basically demands from the existing manufacturing sectors which are not necessarily um, uh, the ones we want to develop in, uh, say, the 21st century. Uh, we're talking about out- car industries, uh, things that have been had been in crisis for a long time, uh, which are not really uh, sustainable in a, an environmental um, type of uh, way to start with. But in any case, these were the ones who were who we have. These are our manufacturings. And they were, they had demands, and these demands were uh, basically leading uh, to a change in, in economic policy. But this change in economic policy did not um, work. So, uh, as a result of that, obviously you entered uh, an external deterioration scenario where, as I showed before, commodity prices. Uh, started to be stagnant. So this would already lead to a slowdown in the economy in any case. But then on top of that, um, you had very costly uh, measures being implemented because these tax cuts actually costed a lot. Um, And the result wasn't a boost in investment, wasn't a boost in exports. One could argue that, of course, the European peripheral crisis at that point uh, actually prevented because you had a falling world uh, trade in any case, so it was hard to boost exports in that scenario. But I would say that there is a bad design in the policy. So you you actually they gave very horizontal uh, tax cuts, very generous. Congress started to add sectors into the initial plan uh, because you know other sectors wanted to to pay less taxes as well, and this ended up uh, costing a lot to the budget and did not have an effect in containing the slowdown. Uh, as, a, as, a, as opposed to that, in contrast to that, you actually had fiscal deterioration to starting to show, the, show up. So uh, she did not increase, I mean, spending, public expenditures in Brazil grew less in this period than they had grown before, actually very much less. As I showed in the, in the, in the graph before, public investment stagnated during Dilma's administration. So it's not that there was, uh, say, a boost in in public investment that made, that created a fiscal deterioration, but tax revenues actually grew even less than they did before, both because of the external scenario deterioration and the tax cuts, and basically the failure of these policies in boosting uh, the economy. But of course, when there is commodity, uh, when there is fiscal deterioration, And you then get, in 2014, to a first year of primary deficit. So the the first year public debt increased relative to GDP in Brazil is 2014, which is an election year. She gets to the end of her first uh, uh, term as a president. And at that point, you start facing uh, the big reversal in the external scenario. So the fall in oil prices that I've shown before, uh, it goes since October 2014 to the beginning of 2016, it drops from $85 a barrel to uh, 25. So it's a, it's a big shock, which we have to take into account uh, in that picture. Uh, but then uh, that comes together with a, a, a dominant view in Brazil, which dominated the economic agenda, which is that the whole crisis uh, was generated by fiscal profligacy. So basically fiscal responsibility was the source of all the problems. When in fact, if you look at what's going on in the budget, it's not that you were spending more, you were actually collecting less taxes for different reasons. And the solution wouldn't necessarily focus on a consolidation that is done uh, entirely through spending cuts. But in fact, this is what uh, has been uh, done since then. So you actually enter a new phase in economic policy, which is basically large cuts in public investment um, and uh, an approval of a 10-year constitutional freeze in federal expenditures. So even though the crisis wasn't necessarily generated by spending too much, the solution has been since then focusing on cutting spending, right? Uh, and this, uh, in fact, in the meantime, 
uh, obviously the political situation also deteriorated. So uh, in 2016, you had the impeachment, um, and the promises have been that this impeachment will be enough to, to boost, uh, to restore investors' confidence. Um, but obviously, you're in a year, in 2015 and 16, uh, you're actually um, in a scenario that is an external deterioration. On top of it, large fiscal cuts and big in public investment cuts that will deepen the crisis. Um, and uh, as if it wasn't enough, uh, the central bank also raises rates in this scenario because um, those tariffs that had been controlled uh, artificially in the past have been adjusted very fastly in 2015, leading to higher inflation uh, in spite of the big fall in GDP. So, so you had, say, contractionary fiscal policy, contractionary monetary policy, and a huge contractionary external shock at the same time. Uh, the result of that uh, is one of the deepest recessions in Brazilian history. So the red line is the recession, is the current recession and recovery. Uh, and the, the other lines are previous recessions that Brazil went through. Like, for instance, the blue line is the 81, 83 recession, which is a context of big mountain foreign debt and hyperinflation. It's one of, let's say, one of the worst episodes in economic history in Brazil. And uh, it's very similar in terms of how uh, the magnitude of the fall in GDP. I mean, in 15 and 16, GDP fell 8.2% uh, accumulated in Brazil. So you had one of the deepest recessions. But what's more striking about this chart, the slowest recovery in the history of the Brazilian economy. Um, and and uh, obviously, this led to mounting frustration in the population. So coming to what happened since then. So um, basically, uh, to point out uh, to go back to the initial motivation here. So basically, you ha you're, you're in a country, you, you come to the 2018 elections, you get there um, in, uh, with the unemployment rate almost having doubled, like <laughs> since, uh, 20, since the previous election, the unemployment rate went from uh, 6.5 million people to 13 million people. So it's huge unemployment. Um, promises of... Uh, recovery coming from an impeachment process that was highly controversial, uh, promises of uh, a recovery coming from uh, the approval of a set of pro-market reforms, uh, labor reform, flexibilization, um, the, the freeze in public spending. So a bunch of things have been approved and they, none of them have worked. I mean, we're still in the slowest recovery in history. Um, and we come to these elections. So this is where uh, I wanted to get. I mean, when we come to these elections then, um, I mean, if we take uh, the, uh, the comparison to the other, um, to the rise of the far right in other countries, as I was arguing at the beginning, uh, we do see, of course, a common aspect related to the squeezed middle that we had in the 2000s, if we want to stick to the more long run uh, view of this. So yes, Brazil is a, a country uh, with uh, deindustrialization since the 90s. It is a country, uh, one could argue that, yes, we do have um, a big loss in manufacturing uh, jobs. So one could argue that maybe we did benefit momentarily from uh, the commodity price boom, but somehow we converged to the rest of the world's uh, problems by the time this boom ended. So that's one possibility, right? Uh, not necessarily mutually exclusive to, to what I'm, I'm going to say uh, later. But it's also true that when it comes to the more short-run uh, situation, uh, we um, have even more to say. Like, this is an economy that uh, was facing a deep recession, uh, that also faced austerity, uh, rising inequality, as I showed in that graph, uh, and, and mounting frustration in the population because of that. So... If, if Brazil is to give any lessons to, let's say, the understanding of these phenomena worldwide, I would say that the short run matters. Uh, it's, it's hard to make the case that it's only the long run globalization process that uh, plays a role here. I think the, the evidence that you have, for instance, that austerity matters for Brexit and other phenomena uh, have to, to be given some attention here. It seems that the short run matters more than, than we think. 
Um, then, if I go back to Danny Roderick's terminology of which societal cleavages have been focused and stressed by populist politicians in each scenario, um, it's clearly a case of, well, um, a very morally conservative discourse, so that approaches the, the sort of the identity cleavage story that we see in Europe and the US, but without the immigration component. So the question is, which component uh, uh, can, was used there to, to, I mean, to find a group to blame, um, which is always uh, the strategy in such populist discourses, right? So having a, a simplistic view of who is to blame um, for a certain economic uh, deterioration and so on. Uh, well, I would argue that in Brazil, um, corruption was playing a very important role in these elections. So there was a general understanding, and there's even a poll that shows that 67% of Brazilians actually think that corruption is the cause of the economic crisis. And if you went to Brazil during the election time or the past years and talked to people, uh, you will see that, I mean, no economist actually thinks, across the spectrum, actually think that corruption is the cause of the crisis. Uh, uh, I mean, even if you add up everything, that all the money that is subject to probes and investigations, you don't get to anything significant in economic terms. And, it, and, and it's very, I mean, you don't find an economist who would say this is the cause of the crisis. But these things happened, the car wash operation, Lava Jato, and the economic crisis happened simultaneously in Brazil in terms of occupying the news uh, and capturing uh, the attention of the population. So um, there is a general understanding that corruption is the source of the crisis. And so the group to blame in that case, and the societal cleavage that is stressed by politicians, is the cleavage between society and the political establishment, who basically are corrupt and are stealing the money that should be circulating in the economy, to make it very plain. I mean, the, you, you do see people saying, OK, we're in a bad situation because politicians are stealing all the money. This is pretty much how um, this was understood by a vast majority, and that's understandable. I mean, if you if you take the, obviously, this is a very simple and, and long view of this crisis, but um, it's, it's how general people uh, understood it um, uh, in this time, and obviously this was used uh, by the politicians to um, shift to, to, the, to the right, right? So the political establishment lost, but in particular the left uh, was seen as even more corrupt uh, than the rest of the political establishment and the ones to blame for the economic meltdown. Uh, and this may be one of the reasons why this process, we were discussing this earlier, it may be that other processes and Trump and uh, other these have some of this, but uh, as a general discourse, uh, Trump's election, for instance, did not come with a, a, a pro-market um, uh, economic platform. Uh, it actually came with a lot of aspects of nationalism and, and preventing globalization and so on, and did not count with the support of a, a part of the economic elites, right? Whereas in Brazil, um, uh, in fact, the, the morally conservative discourse was combined to uh, a, a very ultra-liberal economic platform. As you know, the minister uh, of the economy in Bolsonaro, comes from the PhD in Chicago, and it's very, I mean, it's basically arguing for privatizing all the public assets uh, and to reducing the state to basically in all areas, getting rid of welfare states, uh, and even privatizing the public pension system. So it's, um, it's uh, a very economically uh, uh, radical, um, ultra-liberal discourse, and I think that fits perfectly the message um, when we look at uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the, the stress on how the corrupt political establishment was to blame for the crisis. Because the, the idea here is that uh, getting rid of the state in all areas but public safety, uh, it's the one area that they care about the state, uh, uh, getting rid of the state in all areas, uh, a corrupt state, would be the solution to all of the country's problems. Um, just, just one other thing. In yeah. this economic ultra-liberalism included 
opening the economy to the purchase yes. um, by American companies. Yes, exactly. So Brazilian it's, assets. it's uh, open more for trade, opening more for financial globalization. So that's what seems contrasting to uh, other phenomena that are actually uh, moving inwards. And I think that has a lot to do with how um, basically you, you blamed on the state and the, the establishment and on the left. Uh, as opposed to blaming on immigrants or Chinese manufacturers and so on, right? Is it opening specifically to American companies? To well, buy... not only, because they even, at some point, I mean, this has changed. At the beginning, it was American companies, but then now they're also deciding to, well, there's the, the trade agreement with the EU uh, that is being claimed as the big economic uh, good news uh, for Brazil, so um, we'll, we'll see. And, and also, even the economic ultra-liberal discourse has been changing, and we can see some tension between what Bolsonaro wants and what his minister uh, wants, because it will show, uh, obviously, this agenda is not being very, I mean, it's not very popular uh, with uh, the population, so uh, this may change uh, till the end of his administration. Um, finally, so if we if we look at the election data uh, and you actually compare the um, actually I'll go straight to the second chart. If you look at uh, election data and you compare uh, the three last elections in Brazil, these are surveys done by Datafolha, uh, which is one of the main um, uh, institutes that make surveys election surveys uh, before the election. This is the the one the day before the runoff in in all three years. You see that uh, the, the the share of the Workers Party in total votes actually fell much more in the middle of the income distribution. Um, so if you compare the, the black bar with the red bar in the, the, the past two elections, uh, you'll see that actually PT lost more ground in the middle of the income distribution than it did at the bottom. Uh, those who benefited most from uh, the, the times in, in, in power, of course. And, but also at the top, which is something people don't say a lot. So the top, um, as I as I argued before, had we the PT had lost them from 2010 to 2014. But this is not where the main change happened. So the fact that the middle um, left the boat is important because it seems to be the ones who didn't gain so much from the process and who started losing quite fast after the crisis. Uh, started. This is another set of data. This is actual election data from the Tribunal Superior Eleitoral, uh, crossed with data from uh, city uh, income, city average income from another survey that is basically looking at the labor market uh, in different cities in Brazil. You see that uh, the cities that actually lost income, whose average income has fallen between 2014 and 2017, so right the years before the election. Um, saw so, um, a much larger increase uh, between Ayas Fernandes, who was uh, uh, Dilma Rousseff's opponent in 2014, and Bolsonaro. So uh, you do have some evidence. I mean, we've been working, we started to work on this. This is, this is a project that will continue with, with some, some uh, economic study of this. But uh, it, it does seem that Bolsonaro has been gaining more ground relative to IS, or meaning PT has been losing more ground in cities that were more affected by the crisis. So cities um, that actually lost income uh, during this period. I mean, when you go to the cities that actually had larger growth, uh, the difference is not so big. So obviously there is a trend in terms of who, whose house, the house was in the middle are the ones um, uh, that are leaving the boat of the PT but also cities that are, in general, more affected by the crisis also seem to leave the vote. So this, um, let's say, strengthens the, the view that uh, the, the, the crisis, the short term mattered, but also uh, income distribution did matter for this um, election. Um, so the question is, now what? I mean, um, um, the, if this is true, and if economic factors were relevant, obviously there are other factors that are relevant. For instance, the 
the evangelical neopentecostal uh, rise in Brazil. There are other people studying different aspects, which I think are very important here. But if it is true that uh, the crisis matters, and, and in particular for this middle of the distribution that actually represents the majority of voters, uh, um, how is Bolsonaro doing? Uh, and how uh, is he going to do uh, in 2022? Uh, one thing there is that the economy doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So that's the bad news for Brazilians um, uh, who are facing unemployment, but that's also bad news for Bolsonaro. Uh, if, if, we, if we, you know, as opposed to Trump, who we don't know what's going to happen, but who counts, still counts at this moment with the lowest unemployment rate in past 50 years, right? So that's what he has to, to, to show and to, to gain support in the elections. I mean, it doesn't seem like Bolsonaro is getting any, any, anywhere in that front. Uh, uh, we have a very, um, um, basically a labor market that is increasing in terms of precariousness from an informality, wages are still going down. Uh, unemployment rate is very slowly, uh, um, reducing but as i showed it's still uh we're in a stagnation um of income per capita and there's no sign of uh, recovery especially as the agenda is an agenda of austerity and, and 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 nothing seems to be moving to something else maybe he will fire his minister and change the agenda we never know but so far there's no uh there's no sign of that um in fact uh the budget for next year already shows more cuts in social programs because the the ceiling the the spending cap actually starts being getting more restrictive over time so uh the more you move because you're freezing spending at the exact same level and some parts of spending keep increasing such as pensions uh even with the pension reform that was approved this year that is going to be approved very uh, shortly still you don't manage to control and to reduce so fast the 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 pace of uh, of um, the growth rate of, of these parts of the budget, meaning that the space that is uh, remaining for the rest of the budget, which includes social programs, public investment in infrastructure, is getting reduced over time. And, and so this uh, seems to be um, the trend that we're going to see uh, later on. So current proposals include actually getting rid of more aspects of the spending of uh, public spending, uh, so constitutional requirements that we have in Brazil to, to spend a minimum amount with education and health uh, are now in question, so his minister wants to get rid of that. Uh, uh, other people want to get rid of um, basically uh, minimum wage uh, being adjusted by inflation, so uh, this will lead to a real fall in the minimum wage, uh, which is also against the constitution, but uh, if he manages, it's clearly not something that is going to uh, benefit uh, the bottom and the middle of the distribution, as minimum wages in Brazil work not only as a floor for the labor market, but also as a floor for a bunch of social benefits, uh, unemployment insurance, pensions, and other benefits that affect a, 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 a large part of the population. Uh, and on top of that, if it wasn't enough, obviously we're also in the scenario of a slowdown in the world economy. And, and, and so, I mean, there doesn't seem to be any sign of Brazil benefiting again from, say, a good external shock. Um, actually, Brazil is not even gaining uh, much of sympathy uh, from uh, international um, uh, crowds uh, with say, uh, Amazon scandals and other aspects, which may even um, um, prevent him from approving uh, the deal with the EU, which could be, even if in the long run, it's not necessarily benefiting um, development in Brazil, but in the short run, it could benefit agribusiness uh, and lead to some growth. Uh, but not even that uh, is clear now, given that he's speaking, um, he's not moderating his, 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 his discourse. So. I would say that the prospects are for another lost decade. I mean, we, we, we speak of a lost decade in the 80s, another lost decade in the 90s in Brazil uh, in terms of income per capita growth. And if we keep growing, this is basically projecting the same growth rate that we had since 2017. Uh, if we keep growing at that pace, GDP will only get back to its pre-crisis level, meaning 2014, the peak 
uh, in 2025. So it's even more than a decade. Um, and that's much after Bolsonaro's election, meaning that he was going to get to the election and people are still going to be below the absolute level of GDP per capita, that's even worse. Uh, and for the bottom of the distribution, it's even worse uh, that they were in the 2014 election when Dilma was elected last time. So we're speaking of uh, a situation that doesn't strike as favorable for him. Uh, and well, uh, if we look at his rejection rates, um, they, he seems to be losing ground for the, uh, households uh, that are at the bottom and at the middle of the distribution. What is this um, rejection rate? Fast. How how is that calculated? Well, uh, that's a survey that asks to people: Is the government bad? Is the government very bad? Is the government good? Is the government so-so, or is it great? Right. So the rejection is basically computing the bad and the very bad. Uh, in answer to the survey, um, this is April, this is the red one, is July. I mean, you do see that he's losing uh, support. You, if you look at the approval rate, you see the exact same uh, pattern. Um, but not, uh, not at the, not the, the top. Mm. Uh, and so uh, those who, uh, let's say, were since the beginning uh, on board uh, or against the PT don't seem to be changing uh, very fast. Uh, there is sign that the Amazon scandals did move a little bit the support uh, from, let's say, the intellectual elites. Uh, but when you look at 10 minimum wages, you're not only talking about the very top, you're talking in Brazil about uh, different kinds of people who uh, can also be um, very, uh, let's say, supportive of the, the hardcore Bolsonaro uh, values, including um, a rejection of uh, the idea of climate change and um, things like that. So, well, uh, I will leave it for the Q&A, but um, I think um, the main point is, is that, well, we do share common aspects um, with other phenomena, uh, but I think we, we can leave at least, I mean, if the Brazilians here uh, have a lot of reasons to be pessimistic, um, I would, I would argue that Bolsonaro is so much worse than so many other uh, situations uh, around the world that at least the rest of the world can feel a little uh, relieved. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll begin okay. with that and, and, and hope for that. <laughs>
show, right? Because they, they want their faithful uh, fans. Uh, in that sense, I mean, it could go there uh, potentially if, if, if the economic situation uh, deteriorates, if he loses even more support in the population, uh, if it starts to harm important um, economic elites, um, for instance, the episodes with the Amazon scandals have led to a big reaction by, uh, let's say, the modern um, agricultural Brazilian sector, who did not want to lose exports, and they were not burning the Amazon. Uh, they were the ones who actually wanted access to, um, um, say, European markets, and who started to, and it was part of Bolsonaro's base in Congress. They're very important influence in that base, and they started to leave the boat when they realized that this was harming their business. So this could happen. But so far, I don't think we're anywhere close to that. Uh, I actually think there is no political support for impeachment. And as impeachment became this um, no-confidence vote, but in a presidentialist system for us, uh, we, we, we would need more support to, to get there. And I don't think, I don't think we, we're headed uh, to this uh, anywhere soon. No. And the next election is... It's in, well. We're only six months. I know it sounds. Uh, I know. <laughs> I know it sounds uh, more like for us. It seems like five years, but it's six months only. We still have three and a half years. So then, <laughs> so the next election is in 2022. Yeah. Yes. What do you think that you have to recall? Vice president is a general. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, it's not even a desirable necessary. It's not even a desirable outcome necessarily because basically we're speaking about the military uh, vice president who is a general uh, being the the the, the next president. If we were have impeachment, I mean, last time this happened, it took us thirty years so to to get <laughs> to get a civilian again. So I'm not even sure uh, this would be uh, uh, desirable. Uh, it's the same dilemma in the United States. Would president? Hence, be better than President Trump. Um, any, any more? Yes. Um, uh, I wanted to, to know a little bit more about the platform that you joined in the economic team of uh, Young Bulls and Sonia Guadalajara. Uh, how you were seeing back, back then the possibilities, the alternative possibilities to uh, put the economic growth of Brazil again, and so. To talk a little bit of what were you thinking uh, if they they were elected, and how do you think that uh, some or maybe a few of the the measures that you were thinking by then could be implemented now, even though it's Bolsonaro? So, so. Uh, that was a question from a very much insider. So yeah, we will explain. Time. Yeah, should we collect a couple or yeah? Okay. yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mara. Yes. Mara organized this whole event, by the way. <laughs> okay, I, I have actually, um, um, I mean, I have two questions. One of them, since you're comparing here the situation between uh, England, Brazil, and the US, uh, <laughs> the geography of the votes here uh, is also quite a, a relevant aspect because we don't have the sort of high density versus low density thing. And if you look at the sort of intra-urban voting pattern, you see that places like uh, Belo Horizonte, where I'm from, there was like almost a Bolsonaro won almost in every single neighborhood yeah. of the of the city. So uh, talk a bit about that. And also another where is, thing, where is that? And Minas is Gerais. It's, it's a probably, big city. It's a large yeah. city. So, in, in but Rio okay. and Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a bit different because uh, PT has a bit of. Uh, an influence there, mm. but if you look at Sao Paulo, Rio, and Belo Horizonte, one of the, the main three, capitals, um, the, yes. the sort of intra urban voting pattern is, is quite scary. Yeah, <laughs> it's a uh, it doesn't have like a pattern as well, a rural urban. versus urban, and uh, also story. a yeah. high versus low income. You can yeah, had Bolsonaro winning, and uh, and even in like the periphery, so. yeah. And the second question, which relates more with my my, kind of my own research, we're talking a bit. Uh, how sort of like the, even uh, the, the growth that we've seen in terms of employment lately is mainly in the informal market, right? 
informal. In the informal market. Growth of employment is in the informal market. The yes. bullshit jobs. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and, uh, in, the, in the formal market is a very low wage. Very low yeah. wage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and speaking with uh, some of those people uh, in my own work, they, uh, they don't seem to feel like the policies that the Workers' <laughs> Party was proposing would reach them. Such as lower, like uh, increasing minimum wages or uh, things like that. So, if you could speak a bit about sort of like uh, I don't know how res this restructuring of the labor market can affect uh, the capacity of uh, labor parties around the world as well to sort of gain support. Yeah. Small question. Yeah. <laughs> These are not small questions, <laughs> and, and I think it would be a good idea if you tried to answer. Okay. In, including this one from yeah. the Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so I'll explain. Uh, I, I took part in a first stage of, um, say, uh, economic program, building an economic program for um, Guilherme Boulos, who was a candidate in the Socialist Party in Brazil, who is not the PT, so as I say, to the left of the PT. Uh, but then uh, that was it, right? I did not continue uh, in, in the campaign. Uh, I think, well, uh, you're asking in a way a personal question in the middle of uh, a more general question on what I think the agenda should be, right? So, of course, this experience did oblige uh, all of us as the team who took part in that to build an actual plan. And, and I think this was very important in terms of even being obliged to have numbers for um, how much you can actually increase, for instance, social spending or public investment in infrastructure um, uh, in an economy like that, How ki which kind of industrial policy or productive development policy if you go uh, to a broader way to, to think of it you can have uh, without incurring the same mistakes that have been um, I think part of uh, the shift in economic policy that I showed so um, so uh, if you don't want to just give tax cuts to, to corporations in current manufacturing sector in Brazil what can you do in terms of diversifying in the industrial structure in a context of globalization and uh, basically uh, uh, ways to the bottom uh, um, uh, around the world where you cut wages and rights and so on. So uh, these were challenges that we had to deal with. Um, uh, I think uh, what, what what's clear is that in terms of setting an agenda, and this is also clear in the current economic debate in the U.S., uh, uh, I, th I think, I mean, the Green New Deal is, say, the, the central aspect of that, uh, but uh, a plan can be built. Obviously, uh, in order to fund it, uh, you would need to increase the tax burden on certain sectors of society. And I don't think it's anything different in Brazil. I mean, we could do that. In fact, we have a very unfair and unjust tax system in Brazil, uh, uh, much more than in the U.S. Like, uh, it's a very regressive system where uh, the rich... Uh, pay at most 27.5 percent uh, income um, taxes, and and these taxes are not even paid by most of them because they have exemptions on dividend uh, uh, receive uh, on basically dividend dividend payments, meaning that um, everyone is a company. Uh, everyone does the work and everyone gets the dividend from their own companies and doesn't pay income taxes. That's pretty much what the rich uh, in Brazil do. So if you take that, I mean, we have even more room than, and plus our tax rate uh, relative to GDP is lower than uh, OECD uh, countries, even in the aggregate. Um, and people tend to forget when they look at comparisons of the tax burden in Brazil, and they say, okay, we pay too many tax, too much in taxes to get very bad services. Uh, people tend to forget that we're the only country in the world that has a, a public health universal system that uh, actually has more than 100 million people uh, uh, being um, uh, attended by the system. And so um, we actually spend much less per capita um, than countries in the OECD. So I think there will be a huge room for um, uh, taxing, say, a tax, taxing the rich type of um, uh, agenda that has been discussed elsewhere, uh, while um, also there is the clear 
um, cases, um, uh, I mean, there in the U.S., let's say the Green New Deal was the, the big mission-oriented type of um, plan that was built, uh, which speaks to a very 21st century challenge. But in Brazil, I mean, we still don't even have sewage systems working for 40% of the population. You have uh, uh, huge challenges that are very uh, clear and, and immediate in terms of the quality of uh, health and education systems. Uh, Infra urban infrastructure, I mean, we don't have uh, basic urban infrastructure. So I think the challenges are very clear, and I think focus is investment on these challenges and, and uh, uh, using that, as the Green New Deal does, to foster innovation and technology in, in, uh, uh, in producers would be the way to go. I think, uh, I mean, building an agenda is not the hardest thing. In fact, the problem is the political constraints and how uh, the, the the political system is dominated by the interests of um, the economic uh, financial elites and how it's very hard to 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 change that. Um, well, um, when it comes to matters, uh, two questions. Well. Um, I think, yes, the regional story uh, is very different. Um, the, the geography of these votes is very different. So you don't have in Brazil, and that's something I skipped even in one of the charts. I mean, when you actually look at the, 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 the distribution of votes across different uh, household uh, income classes, uh, you see, as opposed to... Uh, the Western countries that, in fact, uh, it's not the the poor voters uh, from rural areas that uh, have, um, say, elected Bolsonaro in its majority. It seems to be the the high income city people. If you take the absolute share of votes, right? Um, and it's true. I mean, the Northeast still supported the. The Workers' Party, and this is where you have the largest concentration in Brazil of low-income voters, whereas the Southeast and the South uh, largely supported uh, Bolsonaro, and this is also the, what you were saying about the cities. But uh, what I wanted to show is that when you look at the change between the two elections, things start to change a bit. Uh, it is true that you still have this pattern, and but this was also true in 2010. This was also true in 2014. Uh, the difference came from these middle-income voters. And, and I have to say, this also explains why in these capitals, the periphery was lost in between 2014 and 2015. Because the, the middle-income workers are, say, the, the poor voters in big cities. It coincides with, because basically the bottom 50% in Brazil, these are really poor uh, people who generally rely on social benefits and who are largely concentrated in the north and the northeast of the country. Whereas the middle income voters that I show here who, who say make two, two minimum wages, three minimum wages, this is the salary of say a domestic worker, um, a cleaner, a cleaning person in a big city. So, we're well, speaking here, this middle is the one that shifted, and I think this has a lot to do, of course, we need to do more research, and even the geographical, uh, looking at this in regional terms is important, uh, but it seems to be that the PT has lost the periphery voters, who are also informal uh, who at least joined again the informal market in this period between 2014 and 2018. And obviously, um, one could argue that the policies were never benefiting the informal sector, but it's also true that in, in the 2000s you saw a big increase in the degree of formalization in the Brazilian labor market. A so, formalization. A formalization. formalization. Yes. So, uh, it, while the boom has lasted, you actually saw uh, the informal sector in Brazil being uh, reduced uh, significantly. Uh, and this has also benefited the wages of the informal sector because uh, when, you know, the formal sector is paying more, you, and this you're seeing now in the U.S. even, uh, when the unemployment rate gets really low, you start increasing the, the, bar the bargaining power of workers at the very bottom, and they tend to gain, uh, they, they, they tend to gain from the process. Even those who are below the minimum wage, they, they had strong wage gains and income gains uh, 
in this period. And obviously, this is exactly the opposite of what's the reversal of what's happening since the crisis started. So in 2015, these were the workers that were more affected. You, you had huge uh, job losses in construction, which is a sector, well, very low-skilled worker, in, in, very uh, intensive in low-skilled labor in Brazil. Uh, these are people who ended up in the informal sector, for instance, in personal services. So these sectors that were booming were the ones who started to lose much faster and and I think yes that's that's part of um, the explanation probably this is the group to look at both in anthropological ethnographic uh, type of uh, researches but also to try to understand this in, in in the data because I think it's um it's the group that actually changed there is this very famous discourse by um a speech by by a rapper from the Sao Paulo periphery during the elections Mano Brown I don't know if you remember, it was very polemic. People in the Workers' Party was were uh, hating him for what he said. But there was something important there that needs to be looked at when he talked about, okay, I mean, the Workers' Party is not speaking to the periphery. I know these people, and they, they don't they don't see why they would benefit from this anymore. They're, they're, in, they're in an informal sector. They think of themselves as entrepreneurs. Uh, they're self-employed. And they don't touch the benefits. So how to, to, to get these people back on uh, a, a progressive plat platform is the big challenge here, for sure. Yes. Uh, Absolutely nothing, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, Laura, first, thanks for the talk. Very exciting. Uh, I have two related questions. So, first of all, uh, I was wondering if we, in the Brazilian case, if we are really talking about a shift to the left or more of a reaction against the, oh, sorry, a shift to the, to the right or a reaction against the left and the establishment system, the political establishment, uh, that, that because, uh, as, as you show, uh, so Brazilians start to, to believe that corruption is to blame, and that the left and the establishment, yeah. the political establishment are to blame for the corruption. So then my second question, so how can we understand the building up of the discourse that led the Brazilian population okay, to, to believe that? To believe that um, the, the role of the media or the information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's important. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I think yes. Uh, your 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 question is key. And and when I when I pointed towards okay, I don't think the economy is going anywhere. I think the labor market is weak. In a way, what I was trying to say is that this is very likely that we get to the situation uh, Argentina got. Um, um, well, in in a in a delayed, let's say, um, period. Obviously, um, one can no, but in fact, I mean, what's very clear in terms of the empirical research on labor markets is that uh, even if you don't have, even if you don't have the, even if you don't have a formal labor contract, and you're in this economy of, uh, say, self-employment or. Uh, it depends on how, how you want to call it. If you want to make it nice, sound nice, you're going to say entrepreneur. When, when you actually look at the data, it's actually precarious, uh, workers many, many, in many cases. Uh, when you look at this section, I mean, Clearly, it's a, it's a section of, uh, that benefits a lot from economic growth and from low unemployment. Uh, it's very hard for them to, to, to make a living if you're in a crisis. So, uh, it's actually the ones that suffered the most the effects from the current crisis. And uh, if you don't have a strong labor market, uh, 
if you don't have a recovery of the economy, I don't see anything um, uh, improving for um, this part of the population. Uh, and this is obviously in Argentina, you have the, the, the say the, it's aggravated by high inflation. We don't have an inflationary um, scenario in Brazil. In fact, we, we have very low inflation for our historical standards. Uh, it's below the floor of monetary policy right now because the recession is so deep, but we also don't have wage growth. Um, in fact, wages have been falling and income have been falling for the self-employed as well uh, in, in all the last uh, data that we had for the labor market. So uh, in terms of policies that would benefit them, I don't see much. I mean, I, what I do see is there were some measures, very uh, safe market measures of let's try to flexibilize labor market contracts. Um, so this was done a couple of years ago, and now Bolsonaro wants to do an, a second round of labor reforms, um, which he argues would benefit these people. Uh, but it, as a result, I don't think it will, uh, because as we've been seeing in the past years, without an economic uh, recovery, um, it's bad. Even if you flexibilize, you can reduce labor costs, but it's not really incorporating these people back into the labor market. So I think that's his weakness, really. Um, the fact that these people, I don't think the, uh, the vast majority of uh, the population is not necessarily supporting him because of his uh, fanatic uh, discourse it supported him because of amounting frustration with uh, the economic situation, um, at, at, at least as one of the big uh, parts of this. And I don't think they're faithful to him. And we're starting to see already that rejections rates have been increasing in, 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 in this part of uh, the population. So the, the bottom line is that uh, people, or many people, voted for Bolsonaro not because they were attracted to his program, but because he was anybody but the PT. Yeah. And they yeah. felt very resentful, let down by the PT. Not only the PT, but the PT and the entire political establishment. Uh, so the PSDB has lost a lot of grounds as well in this election. I think there was a, uh, an idea of trying to get someone from outside the political establishment. If anything, in reality, Bolsonaro is someone who has always been in the political establishment and had also very corrupt ties to... I, I, won't, I won't have time to... Anything. I won't have time to, to get into that now. But yeah, I think this was the, the what convinced people and I think it's easily to get them unconvinced and you start to see that in the streets I mean already uh, you, it's easy to get them unconvinced yes unconvinced. Uh, in taxi I mean taxi drivers are a very uh, uh, interesting phenomenon in Brazil <laughs> uh, it's usually where you get uh, very um, uh, right wing uh, discourses and so on and, and already uh, I don't see support for Bolsonaro in any taxi driver I take so uh, <laughs> it's, it's there's something there uh, which I think um, may lead to a change the difference is that I don't see in the Workers' Party in Brazil, uh, anything building as a, say, uh, a return that is so appealing as, um, uh, say, the Hernandez um, uh, Kirchner alliance there for this election. So it's going to be harder to, to get back, especially as Lula is still in prison. Uh, and the, the situation for the Workers' Party, I think, is, uh, is harder in terms of trying to get the voters back than in Argentina. So what it's about Gomez. Is Gomez uh, I, 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 well, well, he is a player, but I don't see. I mean, it's a player who only had twelve percent to thirteen percent of the votes in the past three elections. Didn't grow, so I, I, it's hard to see him as uh, having the majority. Yes. Yes. Oh, there's, but there's a, there's a question by Wagner here oh. that I uh, on the media and corruption. Um, yes, um, the media had a, a big role. I think the media, there was a recent, uh, self-criticism even by, um, say, Folha de São Paulo, the, the newspaper I write, I write for, um, saying that maybe they gave too many headlines for Operation Car Wash. Uh, uh, it's, it's clearly, uh, the case that, I mean, the fact that there was so much attention to this operation as saving somehow the Brazilian future, at the same time as the economic crisis was building up, uh, I think that it was oversold uh, 
as uh, a, an idea of, of um, uh, blaming. And I think it is, yeah, yeah. And I think it's also the case that um, they believed, uh, and a, a big part of the economic intellectual elite um, in the country did believe that this was the way to, to get the Workers' Party out and replace it by PSDB, um, the, the, the traditional opposition. And then uh, it, it, it somehow uh, um, backlashed into basically um, no political established politician having any credibility anymore. And, and I think this is something they are starting to um, realize. There's yeah. a question down the back there. Yes. Yeah. Economic consequences of the crisis in terms of violence and the manipulation that this crisis of the voting has been tested in the past. The effect of the crisis on uh, on violence. Crisis, violence. Yeah, and Bolsonaro had a strong agenda on that. Yeah. Um, and one, one more. Yeah, just taking you back to where your slide in 2010, you said the service inflation was rising, the currency was very high then, the commodity cycle was running. Is there anything that actually could have been done, or was it a no-win, no-win scenario that this was a global commodity bubble, as it turned out, the trend is one, and you know there's not much you could have done with a overvalued AI, you know, to really match that. How mm. absent of, of running much more counter cyclical fiscal policy and cutting this government investment then to ramp it up in yeah. theory in a traditional, you know. Even that probably wouldn't have done it. Was there actually a way out, or was this always going to end, you know, in, in tears if once the crisis fell soon? Yeah, that's it. Well, if the Brazilian, distinguished Brazilian economist Luis Carlos Bresa Pereira was in the room, he would be asking exchange you, rate devaluation. Yes, yes. He, would be, <laughs> he would be asking you about the exchange rate because yeah. he is obsessed with the yes. exchange rate. Clearly. Brazil's problem is so to do with playing. the overvalued exchange rate. And the question is, uh, why is the government not taking various steps that it could have taken over decades to lower the exchange rate so that manufacturing exports can be competitive? Okay. That would be his I'll, line. I'll, I'll, I can answer Bless's question. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, um, yes, I think the, the violence and the well, the, this, the, the public safety issue is central uh, as well. Uh, as I said, there are other aspects that are central, like the neo-Pentecostal um, um, growth uh, in this election. Um, and definitely there is an economic aspect to it, even though it, if you take the Rio story, I mean, Rio is a very emblematic uh, city for this election because it's where the PT lost more votes. If you take the state of Rio uh, and you actually... If you take the 10 cities where PT has lost more ground between 2014 and 2018, uh, Rio, the state of Rio has six of them. So it's, um, uh, in, in a way, it's an epicenter for many things that are behind this election. Uh, the economic crisis, which I think uh, came later and was deeper than in many other places. So uh, it's, a, it's a state that relied a lot on oil. Uh, rallies, so it, it, but it had the 2016 Olympics postponing the crisis for a bit because it had a lot of money coming in and out of a sudden the crisis hits and it hits badly. Uh, the unemployment rate jumped much faster than everywhere else. And together with it, it's a huge problem of, um, basically, uh, war on drugs that never worked and had a lot of, um, uh, anyway, a uh, dispute among drug dealers and the militias and Bolsonaro comes from Rio and has the, 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 the support of the policemen in Rio and the militias, been, uh, the militias, I heard it's not a good English translation. It's basically paramilitary groups that uh, dominate uh, Rio sl- uh, slums, favelas, um, and dispute the power with with the drug dealers. So this is a huge problem. Obviously, the economic crisis has exacerbated this problem. Uh, there's a very famous 
um, answer to an interview by uh, Fernandinho Vera Mar, is a, a very he used to be a very a chief of the drug dealers in in Brazil, who was arrested and said, "Oh, my enemy in the 2000s, he was arrested during the commodity price boom." And he said, "Oh, uh, what's really harming my business is Lula, because people don't want to work for the drug dealers uh, anymore. Uh, if they're they're getting uh, paid uh, in the labor market." Um, uh, more than, than I can give. And so obviously there is an economic uh, situation and connection and link between um, the business of the drug dealing uh, and, and, and the violence that comes up when, when there is no crisis, when there is an economic crisis. But I would say that there is also a long run story um, there of a clear problem of managing uh, this in a in a in a smart uh, way, right? The the war on drugs and how this will never uh, succeed in actually fighting drugs, but does succeed in leading to other horrible phenomena. Uh, so yes, um, I think that's a point, and he appealed to these economic elites that are actually feeling insecure physically, not economically. And Bolsonaro has a very um, hard uh, core discourse on basically death penalty um, and a lot of other, basically allowing policemen to shoot the favelas. The governor of Rio uh, also incorporated this discourse. So, yes, that's one element that I think um, uh, adds to, to the issue. Uh, but then there, again, I don't see any improvement, any real improvement uh, uh, coming uh, in the horizon. Actually, you do see, um, well, you do see a lot of civilians getting shot and and uh, dying, and but you don't see an actual decrease in in uh, in crime rates that may uh, say give him the support for this. So I don't know if the propaganda will be enough to. To keep these elites on board, or or if you want, but it's uh, definitely an important aspect. Um, and then David's question on could you could anything have been done? I, well, yes, I do think that depends of when you look at it. I think that if you take the beginning of the commodity price boom, uh, could anything have been done to actually uh, develop, um, say, exporting capacity in? some sectors uh, in the Brazilian economy, which could have led to a more uh, favorable uh, position when the commodity boom ended, right? Um, probably could. I don't think, I mean, Pedro, who is a professor here, has been doing research, Pedro Loreiro, uh, has been doing research on this. I think, yes, clearly there was no long-run plan for diversifying the industrial structure, which I think goes beyond the exchange rate. Obviously, the overvaluation of the exchange rate doesn't help, but I would stress that Brazil has been losing manufacturing since the 90s, and it hasn't always been a problem of exchange rate of overvaluation. I mean, it's basically the problem everyone else is facing uh, when you compare your, your costs to Chinese or East Asian uh, countries or, well, not even East Asian, South Asian uh, economies. I mean, we're speaking, Brazil is a high, it's a media, middle income country. It's not a low income country. And it, to actually devalue the exchange rate enough to make us competitive would imply in a big reduction in real wages and a redistribution that is uh, very regressive um, in a country like ours, in a democracy, which is not something you 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 want to do uh, if you if you want to get reelected, then it's not even something you want to do if you want to benefit um, the, the the vulnerable people in the in the short run. So there is a problem. Uh, I don't think it's easy. I think there is also a, co a question of how um, a lot of instruments for industrial policy have been. Uh, rest um, basically restricted to developing countries in, 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 uh, after the WTO and other uh, multilateral organizations have basically set the rules on this. And so it's not always easy to do this, but it would have been the way. And yes, what you said is also the case. I mean, we didn't, we do do, our fiscal rules favor very pro cyclical behavior. So we have growth, revenues grow. Then we have a very easy uh, way to 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 meet the the primary targets, the primary 
budget targets for the government. So you spend more when you, you grow more. And then when the boom ends, you actually have to cut uh, rather than, than doing the opposite. And this is clearly the case. I mean, the, the rules are, are bad and nothing has been done in terms of changing those rules. In fact, the PT actually thought that they were, you know, basically, uh, they were doing pretty well. I mean, we're, we're, we have tax revenues growing and we, we're meeting the targets. We're reducing public debt. Um, but then, uh, I mean, they didn't create the rules, but they didn't change the rules. So that's, that's one thing that could be sad. I mean, it could also be sad that the whole redistribution from the middle to the bottom has to do with the fact that they did not want to enter a conflict with the top. So there was an idea of reconciling interests there, uh, in the origin of how Lula, even as a trade unioner, uh, um, always behaved in terms of negotiating with the different parts, which can be seen as uh, a, a limit to to how you can continue such a process. Because obviously, if you wanted to enter a conflict with the very top, you could have continued redistributing to the middle and to the bottom, rather than just accepting um, the thing. Whether it's politically viable, we we'll never know. I mean, he could have also suffered the coup uh, at that point. We, we we will never know, right? But I think in economic, in strictly economic terms, you could have done things. Uh, one thing that one one has to say, especially if compared to Argentina, that is important, that was done, and that uh, is still very crucial to why this crisis has not turned into a balance of payments crisis of the kind we had in the eighties and the type of IMF uh, help that we we relied on before is that the one counter cyclical thing that was important then is that we accumulated uh, very huge levels of foreign reserves, foreign international reserves. Um, the central bank actually um, managed to take advantage of the commodity price boom to do that. But then uh, some people uh, actually, including Sirogones and others, have proposed to use those reserves now to say, invest or do something to, to, to leave the slump, which is a very delicate matter as it can easily create expectations that uh, we're going to actually um, get rid of these reserves and l get less, more vulnerable in, in, in uh, our external position and, and turn into something that Argentina uh, is very used to uh, working with. Uh, so, um, that's that's one thing, uh, that I, but at least it prevented this crisis to become, uh, let's say, a default type of crisis. So in a sense, I mean, public debt in Brazil is internal, it's domestic. It's uh, it's um, uh, basically bonds that uh, are in the hands of both foreign and domestic investors. And I mean, it's now even low cost in terms of our historical past. Interest rates have been reduced quite a lot. So Current estimations are that we can actually have a run a primary, a small primary deficit and still uh, stabilize public debt relative to GDP if we have a growth rate in the economy of like 1.2, 1.3%, which is not much. So, I mean, one can make the case for actually spending and, and increasing um, uh, public investment now as a way to, to leave the slump, even without generating any of that issues. So I think uh, there's a lot of choice, um, there that could, that could have been made since 2011. Okay. We have to wind this up, but I'll just make one last point, which is that a few years ago, the Financial Times reported that almost all of the extremely elaborate costumes worn for carnival in Brazil are made in China. Um, having 20 years ago been made entirely in Brazil, they're now made in China and Brazil exports raw materials, commodities to China and, and imports, among other things, these very elaborate carnival costumes. So it's a very good yeah. example of deindustrialization or premature deindustrialization. Laura, thank you very much. That was a thank terrific you. talk. Um, thank you.